Well, we're in week four of this series. We're entitled Q&A, where we're addressing questions that we received that were submitted from the congregation. And um, today's topic had the highest number of questions submitted. The question we want to address today is this. What does the Bible say about sexuality, gender, and identity? Before we jump into this topic, I thought it'd be really important to make sure that we're all operating from the same understanding, the same understanding we've tried to put forth during this entire series, as well as it's really our approach as a congregation. We believe in the authority and the reliability of the Bible to provide truth and wisdom to apply to our lives, to the issues of the world around us, and to navigate the complexity of both. We recognize that God's word reveals God's character and his ways to us. It provides us good news to live by as well as teaches us how to live in a relationship with God but also with each other. God's word is consistent in all of these and can be trusted regardless of our own thoughts, our own preferences, even our own ways and the ways of those in the culture and world around us. This certainly applies to this topic, sexuality. It really always has. To begin our understanding of God's heart in regarding sexuality and what the Bible says about it, we must begin again at the very beginning. We begin by recognizing that sexuality is God's creation. At the beginning of the world, God created all things in perfection with intentional design and purpose, including man and woman. Genesis 1, 26 through 28 reads, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. We see God providing life to humankind, creating both man and woman in his image with value and purpose above all the rest of creation, with sameness as well as uniqueness, male and female, for the joint purpose of reproducing and populating the earth. This is a sacred design and purpose of humankind. And it's also the gift of sexuality from the very beginning. In chapter two of Genesis, God says this, it's not good for man to be alone, All the women said, amen, men too. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, wow, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. I put the wow in there. She said, she will be called woman for she was taken out of the man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. The creation of man and woman was sacred as well as their union. We use the word marriage to refer refer to that union. What God created is beautiful and perfect. The uniting of two into one caused no shame and allowed humans to participate in God's purposes for populating the earth and enjoying relationship with him and with each other. And he made a powerful declaration. I like how the message translates it. It says, it was good, so very good. We see all throughout creation that the counterparts that God put together were intentional. They reflect his goodness and complementary aspects of his creation that make it very good. Things like heaven and earth, light and darkness, land and sea, male and female. One is created to complement or connect to the other, creating harmony and fulfilling God's purposes together. God designed male and female with complementary parts to work together to fulfill his purposes. And he gave them each other to enjoy relationship with him and with each other. Being male and female is a significant part of humanity's identity. This binary sex difference is God's design. And his purposes are affirmed all throughout the Bible and any delineation from it is prohibited to protect the sacredness of the design, and to fulfill God's intended purposes. 
The Old Testament law has plenty of restrictions and prohibitions that help God's people understand his design for sexuality as well as his purposes to many aspects of life, like worship, like life and community. In regard to sexuality, God is very clear to maintain its sacred design and its purposes. Leviticus 18 is one of those spots throughout the Old Testament law where we see several prohibitions that relate to sexuality. God clearly stresses his intended purposes for sexuality strictly between one man and one woman in the context of a marriage union. He forbids sexual relationships outside of this context. There are 18 stated commands regarding sexuality in just this one spot prohibiting a person having sexual relations with anyone or anything. Things like close relatives, animals, even people from the same sex. Anyone or any deviation from this sacred design and purpose is referenced in scripture. It's labeled as sin. Even the polygamy that we see that was prolific in the spiritual as well as the political leaders of the nation of Israel. We might not have always seen their activity addressed, but we often see the negative consequences afterwards. Jesus speaks of, in the New Testament, his affirmation of the Old Testament law. He makes a statement that says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. We see in Jesus' character and activity a full expression of the law's intent. When questioned about divorce, Jesus affirmed the sacredness of marriage between a man and a woman. He said these words, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will be one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. Then Jesus makes a pretty powerful statement. He says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I think he intensifies the sacredness by that statement. Jesus treated sexual intimacy with the same level intensity by making very challenging statements, raising the level of awareness and appropriateness toward God's design and purpose. He said these words in Matthew 5. You've heard it said that you should not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And Jesus says this, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Now, Jesus was not saying that disobeying his design and purpose for sexuality sends you straight to hell. That's not what he's saying. But he is saying that we should not take lightly sin or question God's intent or instructions. Sexuality is God's creation. And his intention is for a man and a woman within the committed union of marriage to enjoy this beauty and pleasure for his creation and fulfill his purposes. When we distort God's design and purpose for sexuality in any way, we invite confusion, chaos, even calamity into our lives and into the lives of others. There's several categories that you might use to refer to the sin that revolves around sexuality. The first is adultery. What is adultery? Well, it's having sexual relationship with anyone other than your spouse, either before you're married or even while you are married. There's a term immorality, which refers to lustful thoughts or desires for anyone or anything in a way outside of the committed union between a husband and wife. There's obscenity or vulgarity, and that is dirty joking. That's pornography. That's naked exposure of any type. And then there's homosexuality, where we substitute a relationship between a man and a man or a woman and a woman instead of the relationship between a man and a woman inside the context of marriage, the way God described it. All of those are ways of us taking what God created with sacred design and purpose and making it into something else. Paul addressed all of this along with several other forms of sin when he wrote to the Romans. Look what he said in Romans chapter one. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people 
who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what they may be known about God is plain to them, because God's made it plain to them. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And then he gives an example. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who's forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, Paul is not singling out sexual sin or even homosexuality as the only way or even the worst way a person can sin. But he's pointing out that when we exchange the truth about God for a lie, we can easily find ourselves behaving in a way that is contrary to God's design and purpose. And we are in error when we do so. Paul lists sexual sin amid all kinds of other sin. And he stresses that God's wrath is poured out on all of them and on all of those who have sinned. We've all rebelled against God in some way, against his design and purpose, in some way or in fact in many ways. And we all deserve punishment for it. That's the seriousness of sin that we discover from the Bible in week two of this series. Now with that as a foundation, many of the questions that we received were focused in on one subject and that is the subject of homosexuality. As I pointed out in week one, the range of these questions went from everything as curiosity to deep personal experience, even pain. And I told you that our default is going to be addressing these questions from a perspective of deep personal experience and pain. And that is true about today. So we must go into this subject with this in mind that these questions are really not about an issue or a subject. It's really about people. And people are complex, and this conversation is complex. As you have seen, the Bible is not silent on the design and purpose of sexuality to be enjoyed and experienced between a man and a woman within the context of the union of marriage. So, simply stated, the Bible is clear that homosexuality is outside of God's design and purpose. Now, that's not a popular statement in our world today or even accepted in many viewpoints. Homosexuality takes what God created with his design and purpose and makes it into something that we desire or for our purposes. It's an inversion and a distortion of God's creation, but it's not new. We see homosexuality practiced as early as chapter 19 of Genesis in the Bible, where we see the the men of Sodom engaging in sexual immorality described as homosexuality. Homosexuality was also very prevalent in the Roman Empire, expressed in many different ways and encouraged in many ways as well, along with many other forms of sexual immorality. Homosexuality moves out of the realm of what's natural, indicating a total throwing off of the design and intentionality that God put into creation. It's just this to say, there's no order, region, or reason, or logic associated with anything. So therefore, we're free to experiment and create at will. We've become our own gods. We've created new orders and new practices. We've placed ourselves at the center of all of life and think that we have the authority to do whatever we want. Pastor J.D. Creer says this. It's as if the earth saying to the sun, I want to be the center of the universe now. Homosexuality is a clear example that Paul gives of us elevating our desires over God's design and purpose, exchanging of what God created for what we want. While what the Bible says about homosexuality specifically is very direct and clear, I wanna say from the very beginning that the church has not done a very good job engaging in the conversation. And we've done even a worse job navigating and caring for those who might be wrestling with it, whatever that relationship might be to mere strangers, to friends, to co-workers, and maybe even more intimately, our own family members. So I wanna start there by addressing 
these questions before moving on to what the culture and world have to say about the subject of sexuality. While it's very clear from the Bible that sexuality is, is not what, or homosexuality is not what God intended us for, the church and many Christians have made it feel like homosexuality is the worst of all sins. It's worse than any other. Well, the Bible is clear that any attitude, any action, any desire, any behavior that's contrary to God's design and purpose is sin. And every one of us is guilty of sin in some way. No sin is greater or worse than the other. All sin breaks God's heart and deserves punishment. Sin separates us from God, and the only remedy for sin is God's grace and salvation in Jesus. All sexual sin is the same. We all, in some way or the other, have distorted God's beautiful creation and made it into something that we want it to be or made it into something it was never intended to be. A God to be worshipped above all others seems to be the theme of our culture today. Interacting with a young family who was returning to the United States after serving lots of years outside of our country on the mission field, they were aghast at how our culture has been so sex crazed. They, they described it like Paul did, that we've created sex to be a God that's worshiped in so many different ways it's hard to even keep track of. Again, I wanna be very clear that Sexual sin is only one type of sin and all sin is viewed the same way by God. When we understand the gravity of our own sin in the light of a holy God and experience his grace toward us, we're transformed into people of compassion ourselves. Our response should be grace to the sinner, welcoming and accepting them with grace and the love of God. We must be cautious not to be attracted or drawn to the sin that we see in the lives of others. We also must be cautious not to affirm sin. We should first and foremost hate the own sin that's in our very own lives. We must remember that pride, anger, gossip, disobeying our parents, being greedy, materialism, selfishness, lusting after a member of the opposite sex, fornication, pornography, all of those are the same as homosexuality. Rosaria Butterfield was once a feminist scholar and described herself as a leftist lesbian professor who delighted in disparaging the Bible and she saw it as stupid, pointless, even menacing. She and her partner enjoyed many activities like AIDS activism, children's health and literacy, golden retriever rescue, and even worshiping at their universalist church. But she had an interaction with a pastor in her town that was gracious, thoughtful, And it left her wrestling with her misconceptions about Christianity and God's word. She began to grapple with her own personal beliefs, her struggles with truth and her life choices. And after taking an honest investigation into the Bible, it was not just her sexuality that was confronted, but the totality of sin that affects all of us. And she made a decision to trust and follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. In her book, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, she writes... Homosexuality is not at the core of our rebellion against God. A desire to be God is. A desire to be the one who gets to declare good and evil, to play judge rather than to be judged. A desire to use God's creation for our own gratification rather than with pleasure and for God's glory. Her words should confront and challenge all of us about the true essence of sin in each and every one of our struggles with it. She shares about her journey and her decision to make Jesus Lord of all of her life in the book I just referenced, as well as her website. I'll refer to that in just a little bit again. As Christians and as the church, we have struggled with living in the tension of loving those who are struggling with homosexuality while affirming the truth found in the Bible. We don't take living and loving like Jesus serious enough. Jesus provides a beautiful example in many moments of how he was full of grace and truth and offered dignity and respect to those who struggled with any type of sin, including sexual sin. Let me give you some examples. Matthew and Zacchaeus were both tax collectors who stole money from their own people, probably even their own families, and they worked for the oppressing government. When Jesus encountered both men, he went to their house, he ate with them, and he offered them sincere friendship. 
As a result, both Matthew and Zacchaeus made a decision to follow Jesus. Matthew became one of the 12 apostles and Zacchaeus is specifically recorded as recounting all of his sinful ways with a repented heart and he even made amendment for his previous ways. Jesus encountered a woman by a well in Samaria that because he was fully God, he knew quite well her sordid past. She had been married five times. She was living with a man who was not her husband. And it's pretty obvious from the text that they weren't necessarily sharing separate rooms or separate beds. But Jesus looked into her eyes and he saw her heart. Jesus spoke to her, which was not acceptable to the other religious leaders of his day. He showed her compassion and respect and gently but surely discussed her current struggles. She did not need him to point out that the way she was experiencing marriage and sexuality was not the way God designed it. He didn't condemn her. He spoke truth to her in grace. And after telling her everything she had ever done, she went and told all of her family and everyone around her that she had found the Messiah. A woman who was caught in adultery by the religious leaders was brought to Jesus. And when he was questioned by them, asking if she should be stoned, Jesus just responded, whoever is without sin, let them throw the first stone. Let's be very clear. Jesus was without sin and could have chucked the first stone. Also, the law required stoning for adultery. But what did Jesus do? Well, he knelt down in the dust. He began to write. And one by one, all the other people dropped their rocks and left. He didn't condemn her. He demonstrated grace. He spoke truth to her when he said, go and sin no more. What's amazing to me is I read through the scriptures, any interaction that Jesus had with sinners, the sinners were never repelled by Jesus. They were actually drawn to him. It was because he lived up to his title, full of grace and full of truth. It was Jesus' compassion and love that changed people when they encountered him. And if you and I truly believe this, then our response should be to carry that compassion and love of Jesus in hopes that people will encounter him when they encounter us and that by encountering him, they too would be changed. We instead often judge people and their sin and in hopes that the people we encounter will actually clean themselves up and then follow Jesus, instead of having a really deep recognition that they just need an encounter with Jesus. I think we subconsciously believe ourselves that we have the capacity to clean ourselves up rather than what we truly need is to encounter the saving work of Jesus Christ and surrender to his lordship. You and I need to live in love like Jesus a lot more, especially in offering dignity and respect to those who practice homosexuality, not dismissing their behavior as sin, but showing them love and compassion like Jesus would, helping them to see God's perfect design as well as his purpose. Someone noted that we as a congregation don't call the people at all of our entrances sin checkers. We actually call them greeters. Aren't you glad we do? If they were sin checkers, this would be a really big open space every Sunday morning. None of us are encouraged to let sin control our lives, but instead to trust in God's perfect design and purpose for our lives and to pursue that in faith, claiming the grace and forgiveness of Jesus for the times that we haven't and relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to make us holy and more and more like Jesus every day. When my kids were younger, we loved going to this park that was not too far from our house. And they had several teeter-totters. You know what that is, that long plank of wood where one kid sits on one end, one sits on the other, and they teeter-tottered. The largest kid usually wins. And so because there was a little uh, weight discrepancy between the two youngest, I would find myself standing in the middle of the teeter-totter and balancing both of them off the ground and kicking back and forth so both of them experienced the fun. And my fun was to stand in the middle and try to balance them both. But it didn't take long for my legs to start shaking. I could feel the tension between those two things. I think you and I need to be comfortable with the tension of loving those who are struggling specifically with homosexuality, but with any sin, 
as well as standing confident and full of grace and truth with what we know God's word teaches. The tension is worth it when we try to live and love like Jesus. We need to be humble enough to recognize that we are all sinners and courageous enough to speak truth in love in the context of relationship, allowing the love and light of Jesus to fill every conversation and interaction with anyone, regardless of their sin. Now let me address uh, some specific questions regarding sexuality, specifically regarding homosexuality. Again, from what the Bible says, I want to remind you that there are really not always yes and no answers to complex issues and questions. But these are some of the questions that were specifically asked, and I'll take a stab at answering them from what the Bible says. The first, are people born gay? Well, all of us are born with the propensity to sin as a result of the choice of that first man and woman in the garden when they chose to disobey God. The sin that we are prone to might be different from person to person. To date, science has not discovered a gay gene. If someone has the propensity to be attracted to someone of the opposite sex, that does not make it God's design or acceptable to him. None of us should find our identity or be labeled by a struggle with sin, regardless of what that struggle might be. We should all find our identity in Jesus alone. I think that's what Paul was saying to the Corinthians when he wrote these words. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Regardless of our struggle with sin, everyone can become what God created us to be from the very beginning. That is, image bearers of God. The second question, is there really such a thing as being transgender? Now, this is a highly complex question, and I don't think it can really be handled well in a free, uh, just a brief, simple statement or two in this moment. But let me say this. A couple of definitions might be helpful for you. First of all, sex is biology. It refers to the anatomy a person is born with. Gender can be sociology. It refers more to social norms and roles that make male and females the, the roles that they play, which can be defined differently based on cultural norms. The Bible recognizes two genders, which are assigned by God as a baby forms in the womb. God intends males to be males and females to be females, though the expression of gender is often tied with culture. And it might differ from time and space depending where you might find yourself. I saw this right in front of my face when traveling to a different culture, like being among the Maasai people in Kenya, Africa. There I'd noticed things that didn't necessarily align with the social norms and gender roles that I'm used to in our country. One was the animal population. In lions, the female lion does all the hunting and the male does all the eating. Now that might not look much different at your house, but I'm just saying, typically, the male's the warrior side and the female's the one who's, who's like caring for that male. Those are just some of the norms that exist in our world, but that one was different. The Maasai, the men wear skirts. I've only been seen in a skirt one time and I just found a picture of that at my dad's house this past week after cleaning it out after his death. It won't be showing you that on the screen. <laughs> Another norm that's based on gender is that in Africa, among the Maasai people specifically, it's not unusual for two men to be seen holding hands walking down the street. It's awkward for me when I'm walking next to a grown African man for him to grab my hand, but he sees it, nothing sexual. It's a sign of friendship. And I lean into that norm that's associated with a gender that is still different from what I experience in my life, in the culture that I live in. People can often be confused when they prefer roles or activities that are typically associated with the other gender. If sore 
stereotype me that, that might be that girls who enjoy sports are often viewed differently or think something might be wrong with them because in our culture for way too long, sports have only been viewed as something males do. Or you can look at cooking or sewing. If boys enjoy that, there can often be this tension or conflict or concern among the individual or certainly their caregivers But I want you to understand that this does not mean that someone's been born with the wrong sex or that perhaps this person has the wrong gender. I also want to be clear that there is a diagnosed disorder called gender dysphoria, where a tremendous amount of anxiety and confusion exists regarding gender, especially in the roles that it plays into. And psychological support and counseling can help a person process these challenges. And we should provide a loving and non-judgmental attitude and space for them to do so. And we should trust God's wisdom, his grace, and his Holy Spirit to do his work. Another question, how do we respond to the laws and messages from the world that label Christians as bigots or homophobic? Well, first, let me remind you of how Jesus lived and loved. He was full of grace and truth. That's how he was described in every setting, full of grace and truth, not the other way around. So the way that we respond to all people, especially those who might be struggling with homosexuality, is to respond full of grace and truth. Always begin a conversation in the manner of grace and truth versus anger or disgust or even judgment. James says these words, be slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to become angry. Be humble. Christians have often more been interested in debating or legislating morality instead of becoming informed and engaging relationally in those who might be struggling with sexuality, especially homosexuality. We don't take our cues from society or media or anyone else, but rather from Jesus. So let me ask you an honest question. Are you more likely to argue, to lobby against, to shun, or to judge? Are you more likely to be hateful or disrespectful to others because of their sin? Then you might be guilty of being a bigot. You might be guilty of being judgmental, even homophobic. You might be guilty of looking past your own sin and pointing out the sin in others. And Jesus has a lot to say about that. Look at his words in Matthew 7. Don't judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the blank in in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, hey, let let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a big old plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's eye. I think there's a little, like, unspoken at the end. You'll probably be a little too busy picking out the specks of your own eye to worry about anybody else's. Will homosexuality keep a person from eternal life? I don't think that question was asked out of curiosity. I think that question is asked out of deep personal experience, and probably even pain. Let me be clear. Homosexuality does not send a person to hell, nor does heterosexuality send you right to heaven. Our sin, not our sexuality, nor uh, our sin, nor our sexuality should define our identity. God should. He created us in his image and for his purposes. And we find our greatest pleasure in fulfilling the sacred design and purpose for which we were created. When we attempt to be God and follow our own desires or pursuits, we often find ourselves rebelling against God and living in ways that are contrary to his ways. But Jesus came to rescue us from ourselves, from our own desires and our sinful pursuits so that we could experience his grace and forgiveness and be restored to our intended state. I love what Paul says to the Ephesians about this. He says this, as for you, meaning all of us, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of this air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. 
all of us, there's that all word again, might not be a bad idea to circle that in your Bible. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, I like to say that's the biggest but in the Bible. But, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's good news, my friend, for all of us. We can all find our identity and who God created us to be, being recreated through Jesus Christ to fulfill God's purposes for us. At Crossroads, we believe all people are created in God's image. We believe that God loves all people and has showed his love by sending his son Jesus to die in our place. And we desire to live in love like his son, Jesus. Preston Sprinkle, who has written a lot about this issue of sexuality and from God's perspective, writes, if God is love and if God wants humans to flourish, then it's not loving, nor would it cause a person to flourish to encourage them to pursue a same-sex sexual intimacy. Scripture was not written to condemn gay people. Rather, the testimony of Scripture is that all people were condemned unless we find our identity in who Jesus is and what he accomplished for us on the cross, giving us his righteousness in exchange for our own filthiness and therefore becoming citizens of God's kingdom. We as a church exist as a community of faith to conform to the image of Jesus and to live under his lordship. We follow a standard that is clearly articulated in the Bible that teaches us what we need to understand about God's character, his nature, and his work. It defines what we should and shouldn't do. And while many of Jesus' teachings require submission and limits, our own personal freedoms, we truly believe that our true identity, our true satisfaction, our true joy, is found in him and in him alone. Before I pray, I just wanna point out once again some resources that we wanna provide for you because we know that a 30 minute conversation, especially a one-sided conversation, doesn't cover all the bases. So I would encourage you to be informed and engaged. Inform yourself on what the Bible says, not what you think it says or what you've always maybe been taught it says. Find out for yourself through good biblical study, what God's word is teaching. And I believe that these resources are trusted and will be helpful to you in exploring not this issue or topic, but actually what God's design for sexuality is all about. Caleb Coltenbach, great resource. Preston Sprinkle. You see down at the bottom, Rosaria Butterfield's book. She's also written a book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Many people in our church have read that. Uh, this Secrets of an unlikely convert speak a lot more of her struggle with sexuality and finding God's help there. If you're a family member or you know of someone who's struggling with the issue of homosexuality, I would highly encourage the resource called A Primer for Parents and Strugglers or the last resource, Design and Intent Ministries. There's a website with not just resources, but support for people all along the spectrum of this topic all of this discovery of sexuality. For those who might be currently struggling to identify their own sexuality and surrender it unto the Lordship of Jesus, and also to those who, like me, have people who are struggling with homosexuality or other aspects of sexuality outside of God's design. It's helping me live in this tension of loving them well like Jesus did, and also being confident in what God teaches in his word, and living in that tension in a way that I hopefully reflects Jesus in everything I say and everything that I do. Once again, let me just reiterate that this message today 
was reviewed by a member of our own congregation who has willingly admitted that same-sex attraction is something that they are working through and has surrendered their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's really important for me to say to a group of people like you that this person has always felt loved and accepted here at this church, even amidst the struggle. I'm proud to be a part of a church like that. The sermon has also been reviewed by two dear friends who both are working through the tension of loving someone in their family that is struggling in the area of sexuality, specifically in the area of homosexuality. And they wanted these words to come across full of grace and truth, not just for their loved one, but for anybody who might be here today, anywhere along this spectrum. With those words, let me just close in prayer. Would you pray with me? God, I love you. And there's areas of my life, God, that obviously the Bible is extremely convicting. And sexuality is certainly one of those. Probably not the only person in the room. God, all along, you've been very clear why you created us. It's because you love us. Why you provide prohibitions and and commands and instructions. It's because you love us. You have purpose and you have value. You have dignity that you have created us in, God. And for all those reasons, Lord, we want to respond to that with faith and trust in you in every aspect of our life. And God, as we've talked specifically today about sexuality, my hope and prayer is every word that's come through my mouth, God, has come from your spirit. It's been full of grace and truth. That all of us, God, especially those who are here today who are struggling in any way with regards to sexuality, and even specifically those who might be wrestling with homosexuality. God, my prayer is that all of us would draw near to you. All of us would pursue you. And we would find that you are pursuing us, that you want a relationship with us. You want what's best for us. That we would not just trust you, we would respond in obedience out of that faith to honor you, to fulfill our sacred design and purpose. God, regardless if we would ever marry or bear children, God, we can all bear your image in the way that we live and in the way that we love. And I pray that we will, and that would all be to your glory, God, we pray through Christ, amen. We have a responsibility, and that responsibility is a privilege. That privilege is to go into a world and to live and to love like Jesus. That's what God would have us do. It'd be all for his glory. And so let's go do that. Have a great week.